Okay, so okay, here's a little bit of a, a nice function here, and when you sketch it, it says use technology, but you've you've all got the skills and tools to be able to sketch this now. You've probably got a good understanding. Let's call this x-axis, y-axis, and can you see that this guy here, x minus one? So basically, x cannot equal one. So that's how we define the actual domain. The domain can be all real, but x can't be one. And you probably get the sense that. If x was 1, there'd be a vertical asymptote. There is no y value to plot with this guy here. Okay. Um, from the discussions that we may have had in class, then you may also know this is a ratio function, a ratio of two linear functions. And so what we can do here is have a little play with, with x values and y values. Now, let's say if x is 100, if x is 1,000, you can think about what's happening here. And 1,000 divided by 999. Uh, 100 divided by 99, the answer is kind of 1. So in fact, what you also find is there is a horizontal asymptote here. Uh, now these asymptotes kind of describe the horizontal one is the, the tendency for the height of the function when x gets very, very big. Okay, uh, And then, then you just have to do some, some other values. So why not we make x equals 0? It just so happens that y turns out to be 0. So it comes, crosses through here. And, and that really tells us all we need to know. You can try a few more points. What about if x was equal to 3? If x equals to 3, uh, y equals to 3 over 2, so it's 1.5. So we've kind of got this idea. And you can choose more points, but I think you've got the general feel for this now. The graph looks like this. You try and do a nice little curve. And now remember, it's just a sketch, so it's not to scale. You want to get the main features of the graph done. Uh, beautiful. All right, so the, the domain is defined as this. Now let's think about the range. Um, well, the range can be anything except for that horizontal asymptote. So in fact, the range also is y is obviously not equal to 1. And so now let's look at a bit of algebra to find the inverse. Let y equal x over x minus 1. We do a bit of multiplying across. We expand the bracket. We rearrange to make x all on one side. Let's just copy this across to the next page. There we go. It looks like I've copied a little bit more over. That's all right. And then we factorize out the x. And then we divide through. Then we write it in functional language. Uh, which is exactly the same as f of x, right? So we've, we've kind of proved that this is a self-inverse function. So f of x equals x over x minus 1 is definitely a self-inverse. And if you go back to the diagram here, what you'll find is, can you see that those crisscrosses? If I just do a little bit of a um, highlight here here. So this crisscross of asymptotes, can you see it's actually symmetrical? It's x equals 1, y equals 1. So therefore you've got that nice line of symmetry going through here. And so you can see the red function itself, if it's reflected over that y equals x line, and you can see it actually just reflects onto itself. So it's a self-inverse. So the geometry tells you it's a self-inverse as well. Um, so let's finish this off now with the, the final bit. And this is all about a basic understanding of um, taking f of both sides. Okay, we f both sides. So let's just write that out now. And I'll switch to a darker color. There we go. Okay, so given f of x equals to f minus 1 of x, if we take f of both sides, just algebraically, now this is for any function, right? Can you see that f of f minus 1 of x, this guy here, actually that just unpacks to give x on its own. And this side just gives f of f of x. So this is also another way of checking whether a function is a self-inverse. And that means if we feed the function f of x, back into itself, things should cancel out to leave just x. So let's try that on the final, final page here. All right, so given we've got f of x equals x over 
x minus 1. So look, I'm going to put a big box around that. Now, the idea is if I feed x into f, out comes x over x minus 1. Okay, now this has got to go back in to f again. Now, the way you've got to think about this is the function f takes an input, I'm going to call it a box, and it divides it by the input minus 1. That's the way you can think about the function. So f takes an input, in this case it was x, we divide it by x minus 1. But for more complicated inputs, we can just call it a, a box. All right, so let's see what that, this looks like now. f of f of x. So we just take the input, x over x minus 1, and we divide it by the input minus 1. Now that, that leads to a very tasty fraction nested in the fraction. Okay, So what you should find is, I'll leave you to try this now, you should find that when you simplify that but put by putting it over common denominators and tidying up, that should leave you with x only. Okay, So that should tidy up. So basically one test for an self-inverse function is, well let's just summarize this. Okay, test for self-inverse. Okay, let's list the three methods. Method one, sketch f of x and it should be already symmetrical. about y equals x, so it just kind of reflects onto itself. Option two, do the algebra rearranging, and that should find that when you find the f minus one of x from the algebra rearranging, it will be the same as f of x. And then three, this kind of strange one at the end there, if you actually substitute f of x back into the f function, they should cancel each other out and give just x. Okay, give that a go. See if it works.